Okay, so last time we had the ability to just play a sequence when the player collided with an object. And we are now going to make it or adapt it so that uh, we, we don't have to hard code which sequence sequence gets played. We can just have an array uh, filled with uh, different sequences to be played in different rooms uh, based on a particular global value, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and that will mean that hopefully, no matter how many cutscenes you wanna have, you know, there's no extra work basically, apart from making the sequences themselves. So uh, I have added a couple of things. So uh, we have a brand new object called OBJ cutscene. Uh, this guy is going to be doing most of the work for cutscenes. Uh, make sure you have it set to persistent. And we also have a brand new room called RM Start. Uh, I have the same, uh, well, I have views enabled, invisible, same width and height for the camera as well as the uh, width and height of the viewport. Um, and also make sure that uh, this first, this new room is going to be the first room. Uh, to do that, then uh, you click on the icon here and you drag whichever room you want to be first to the top. And then you should see a little house icon next to it like this. Um, and then add your new persistent, persistent object into our new room and also instance of the player. Uh, the reason the player is in the room is we're gonna have a line of code in the player whereby we just press a button and we're gonna be warping to the throne room and back. And that's how we're gonna test to make sure uh, sequences are being played in the correct order. And uh, we can also go to the room and no sequence will play if there is none. Uh, and in our new room, make sure you have the same layers just in case we get a crash. So that's what I do anyway. Okay, so we will go on to updating our code next. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're gonna do is in the activate cutscene sequ uh, cut object. In the destroy event, we're gonna comment out this code. Uh, to do that, if you just hold uh, control and K, or if you do control A first to select it all and then control K, uh, that's a fast way to comment out everything. Um, the reason I said to comment it out, not to delete it, is because we're gonna be reusing these, this code uh, in our new object uh, with a very slight change to it. Um, then in our brand new object in the create event, we have a couple of enumerators. Uh, this first enumerator is, uh, it controls the uh, cutscene object as well as the player. So uh, when the main state is ready, the player can move around. Uh, when the state is cutscene, uh, we don't take player input um, apart from uh, dialogue boxes. Uh, and this is the, the state system for the cutscene objects. Uh, I'll explain the states as we get to them. Uh, initially, the cutscene object is going to be idle, so nothing should happen uh, in that state apart from one event, which we'll get to in a minute. And the main state is going to start as ready, so, that, so the player can move around. We're also going to have uh, a global variable called global dot story val. Uh, this number is just basically going to track where the player is up to in the story. And uh, you can just increase this however and whenever you like. Uh, the way that I'm doing it is um, after every sequence is played, this gets increased by one. Um, in a proper game, you know, you'd be increasing it in other ways as well. But it's a pretty, sim pretty simple way to track progress in a story. Uh, I'm going to have three story points. Uh, I've two sequences in total and a third story point where, you know, um, he's seen those two cutscenes, and he can just move around the, uh, the throne room as much as he likes. And we're gonna need a 2D array 
uh, that ge keeps track of uh, what sequences we want to play based on the room and based on the value of global.storyval. So um, the YY, this entry here is going to be the room, uh, which starts at zero and we have two rooms. So this should really be less than, but you know, it's not really a big deal as long as you don't have like a huge number for it. And uh, the same for story points. So initially every entry in the array is, get, array is going to be set to minus one. And then we're just going to overwrite it underneath. So you can see uh, in cut scenes zero and throne room, we want uh, this cut scene, the very first cut scene that we made to play. It's not a very good cut scene, but you know, it's just something to show you for now. Um, and, and that's it. So you can see I have this commented out where when I make a second cutscene, then I'm going to update the array with that as well. So uh, that is the create event. Okay, so it's actually going to make more sense to you now if we do the player step event. Okay, so previously this was our code. Uh, we're going to update it. So we have this code here. So uh, now we have a state system. We're going to wrap our code in a check to see if the main state is ready. This code is the same as before, just checking for a collision. Um, this code has been updated. So previously, if there uh, was, well, this line is new. So basically, we're checking to make sure that there is, uh, first of all, a cutscene object that was the same as before, but also uh, that there actually is a sequence to play. So remember, every entry in cutscenes. Um, it's going to be minus one, um, which means no sequence to play. And then we overwrite it if there should be one. So if there is a sequence a sequence to play, then we're going to change our main state to cutscene. And we're going to change our uh, cutscene object state to init, which is going to start the cutscene to play. Um, and then this was our old code where we destroyed the other cutscene object. But we don't need that anymore because uh, we're actually not going to have any code in that other object. It's just gonna be blank, basically. It's just used for collisions. Um, this is the same as before, you know, moving left or right, very basic movement code. Um, and then this code is new. So uh, this is, when we press F5, we're just gonna check which room we're in. If we're in room start, then we're just gonna to go to the th throne room. If we are in the throne room, then we are gonna to go to room start. So uh, that's how we're gonna be able to quickly test our sequences and our story uh, tracking ability. Okay, so now we are actually gonna do the room start event uh, before the step, because again, uh, this is gonna be happening. This event happens before the step. So uh, to get this event, you just add event or right click, whatever you wanna do, then go down to other, and then there's a, room start event. So uh, because our cutscene object is persistent, every time we enter a new room, this event is going to run. And what we're going to be doing is checking whether there is actually a, a sequence that we want to play um, whenever the player hits the cutscene object in that room and uh, just kind of get things ready, really. And this is actually going to be the code from the activate cutscene. So if you do control A, control A and then control K. No, I'm sorry. Control A and then control V to copy it all. And then if you go into our new room start event and paste it, I'll explain to you uh, the differences in the code. So uh, this line here is just showing me uh, what is actually stored inside our 2D cutscenes array. Uh, just for debugging, you don't have to have that, but you know, um, it will help you out if you need to need to debug something. Um, here, this this line is new, so we're just checking that there actually is a sequence to play in our array. So, any instance, uh, sorry, any entry that is minus one means there's no sequence basically. Um, and this is a huge part of what makes this system work is we're actually grabbing the sequence from our array. And this line before, it had this. 
uh, it had the, the name of a sequence, so basically hard-coded it. So we, it, this line was always going to run the same sequence, but now we're doing this sequence here. Whatever is stored in this array is going to get run, basically. So wherever you see this sequence, just make sure that... Um, uh, sorry. Just, uh, yeah... On uh, in my code here, wherever you see this sequence, make sure you have it because that's mainly the uh, the main difference in the code is this, uh, as well as this line here. So and, and this line here, but it's it's basically this, basically the same code. And uh, if you didn't see part one, uh, I'll just briefly explain to you what we're doing. So um, we grab the sequence you want to play. That there must be sequence because it doesn't equal minus one. Um, we're creating an instance of the sequence and storing it in global.currentSequence. Um, we have objects in our sequence that we want to play. Um, and we the, those objects are stored inside an array, which we're going to get with these three lines. So right now, um, we have, an, ob we have a, an array of objects that are stored in that sequence. And we're going to check them one by one to see if any existing uh, objects like that exist in the room already. Um, one thing to know is right now, uh, the sequence hasn't actually made any objects. There's an array of objects that it wants to make, but it hasn't made them yet. So um, if an instance exists of any of those objects in that array, that means there must already be an object, object in the room. And that's how we know uh, which object to override with what. So room object instance is going to be the first instance of the sequence objects that we find. So for example, in the sequence, we have OBJ player. And in the room, we have OBJ player. So there's two instances. And the one in the room should be the first one because the sequence one hasn't been made yet. So... Um, and we just overwrite the sequence instance with, sorry, we overwrite the sequence instance objects with our room object. So that's all this loop's going to be for. And that's what allows us to uh, move the player in the sequence. And then once the sequence is finished, the player is in, in the same position and we can move him, move him around. And then we just pause the sequence because we might not want to play it yet because uh, the room's literally just started. Uh, the player might have to walk into, uh, you know, he might have to walk a bit further before the sequence starts. So that's why we're pausing it. Okay, so uh, the final event we're going to do right now is the step. Uh, so if you remember, uh, when the player is colliding with the activation object, it checks to see whether there's a sequence to play. And if there is, uh, it sets the uh, the player sets the cutscene object state to init, which is going to start the sequence to play, and then the sequence object sets its state to play, uh, which is this state here. And literally, all that's happening here is uh, the sequence is checking to see if the sequence has finished playing. If it has, then it gets rid of the instance of the sequence that it has created. It resets uh, global.currentSequence to minus one um, and resets its state to idle as well as the main state to ready, which allows the player to move again. If we run the game now, we should be able to make sure this runs properly. So I'm going to press F5. Well, right now I can move left and right, as you can see. I'm going to press F5. The sequence is playing and that's it. I can move again. So. It's, it's nothing fantastic, but uh, this is a huge step forward because now uh, we can have lots of different sequences in the array. And uh, depending on the story point, uh, different ones are going to get played. Uh, of course, this, the uh, global.storyval isn't being updated yet, but uh, I think this is probably a good point to uh, improve our sequence. So we're going to be doing that next. Okay, so as usual, there is a bit of code to do first. Uh, we have a little bit more setting up 
basically uh, we want to be able to change our actors sprites during a sequence uh, and um, the way that I've done it is I have an array called actor objects and then every entry is going to be a different object um, depending on how you have created your game uh, you may need to do this a slightly different way because this uh, array kind of depends upon every NPC being a different object which I normally don't do in my own games but this was like the simplest you know most straightforward way I could think of to get the point across so hopefully um, you don't find it too hard to update if you do let me know I'm sure I can help you out with that anyway uh, so we have an array, we have uh, the player and NPC stored inside it. The reason what this is for is so we're going to make use of broadcast messages to send a string. The string is going to tell us which entry in the array uh, to access, which is going to give us one of these two. And then there's going to be a second number, which is going to tell us the facing to use. Um, and uh, you might not understand what i'm talking about or you won't understand that so if we go into the create events of the player uh, we have a new enumerator called facing or e underscore facing uh, we have up down up right down the left and then uh, each actor is going to have its own array like this called move sprites which just stores uh, what sprite should be used by the actor for what facing so this is the create event for the player and for the NPC, very similar, uh, just this array. You can copy and paste the array and update the names of the sprites like that. Okay, so um, now we have done the setup uh, to show you how this works. Well, actually, there's one more thing to do. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to go into our sequence. And you can see at the very start, the player is facing the wrong way. So uh, we want to make sure that doesn't happen so we're going to click on we're going to make sure the uh the the line is at the very start of the sequence we're going to click on broadcast message and we're going to type uh dollar sign and then zero because we want to change the players facing and then zero is up so uh, that's going to tell the game what facing to do we press ok you see we have a broadcast message and all these are for is for sending strings to whatever object is listening for it which we're gonna do next okay okay so now we're gonna make a new event uh, broadcast message uh, if we go into add event and then other and then at the bottom there's broadcast message that's what we want and so you can see at the top here um, we have if event data question mark event type is equal to sequence event, then do all this stuff. This line is taken from the manual for broadcast messages. And what it is, is uh, event, da event data is a DS map and it just stores, you know, uh, data inside that. And then um, this event is listening for event data and it's listening for the event type of sequence event. So... Um, when you put a broadcast into a sequence, it becomes a sequence event. That's my understanding of it anyway. So we're actually interested in the message part of this DS map. So we're going to use a new variable called broadcast string, and it's going to store whatever is in the message part of event data, which is our string, uh, which is dollar uh, zero underscore zero right now. Okay, that's what a string is. And just for testing, debugging, I'm going to show that value, that string, sorry, inside of the output here. Okay. Um, we're interested in the first part of our string. We want to know what symbol is it because uh, we have a switch, uh, switch statement here, which is going to go through the different symbols and do different things depending on, on what symbol it is. Um, just in case you need lots of different symbols uh, there are, all, are other ways to do this for example you can just use one symbol and then the numbers that come after that symbol uh, de determines what's going to happen uh, but i'm trying to keep this uh, as simple 
and easy to understand as possible. So I'm using a different symbol for different things. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, check what symbol it is. So that's what sim symbol is going to equal a dollar sign right now because we're sending it a dollar sign uh, under dollar sign zero underscore zero. And then um, I've got this uh, comment here just to explain something, but let me uh, do this, these three lines first. So what we want to know right now, okay, is which entry in our actors, actor objects array. We want to know which entry uh, the string is referring to. And the first number that comes after the symbol is going to be that number, but um, it could be a single digit, it could be double digits, it could be you know triple digits. So we can't just say, okay, whatever the second character is, that's the actor, because that might not, not always be the case. So we are going to use a loop that's going to check each of these characters in turn. And then when we get to this underscore, then we're going to say, okay, uh, we must be done with numbers now. So whatever has come before it, is going to be the actor number. Um, to do that, we're going to have a new variable called index, and we're going to start it at two because in strings this is one, this is two, and I'm going to have a new another variable called car, which is going to store the value of whatever is in the string at that position. So when index is one, car would equal a dollar sign, but when index is two, which is what we have set here, then car is going to equal number three. So when index is two, car is three, and then actor ID is eventually going to store all of these numbers, so 300, but right now we're initializing it at nothing. And then we have this loop here, which says while string digits car is not equal to an, an empty string. So uh, why are we doing that? We want to know basically at what point in this string, does car no longer equal a number? And to find that out, there's a useful function called string digits, which basically turns, um, it, it only returns um, a string with any numbers inside of it. Say for example, you had uh, A156 or A1, sorry, yeah, A156. This will just return 156 if you had egg it would return nothing if you had an underscore it also returns an empty string like that so basically this loop is going to go through our string and until it finds a non-digit and then we're done so uh, for as long as car is a number we're going to add car to actor id so when index is two car is three then actor ID is going to equal three. Then index gets increased like here. So now index is three. Car equals string car at broadcast string index. So car is now going to equal zero, which is this one. Oops. And then car, because car is a number it gets added to your actor id and then index moves here equals four car is zero again which is a number so it gets added to actor id and then index gets to here which is five car equals an underscore it's not a number so it doesn't get added to actor id and then this loop is done and then whatever actor ID equals, it becomes the real of itself. So it, just, it just turns itself into an actual number as opposed to just a string. Okay, so um, that's how we get 300 as the number. Right now, obviously, our string is just uh, a dollar sign, a zero, underscore zero. So the message that we sent is getting going to end up with an act, actor ID of zero, but it's just worth understanding uh, why we are using a loop and how it would return uh, numbers that have more than one digit. Okay, so um, that's that. And then uh, if you remember, 
right here, index is equal to five. And then we actually want to know the last digit as well, because that's going to be our facing. It's either going to be zero, one, two, or three. So to get that, we use far facing equals the real of string car at broadcast string index plus one, which is here. This is going to return zero. Once we've done that, we just uh, can make the instance change its sprite. <coughs> so actor objects, actor ID, which is zero, dot sprite index equals actor objects, actor ID, dot move sprites facing. So whatever is facing is going to be zero, one, two, or three. Move sprites stores the sprites for that object in its own array. Um, and that's it. We're just reference, referencing the object directly from the array. Uh, bear in mind that in GameMaker, um, whenever you reference an object, you're always going to return the first instance of that object. So if you have uh, 20 instances of the same object, this isn't going to be a good way to do it. But uh, to keep things simple, uh, I've just done it that way. So just bear that in mind. And then uh, we're done then with, with that case. We just break after that's done because that's we've done what we need to. And, and, and that's it. So we're done with this region right now. So uh, if we run the game, we can see this happen. So press F5. You can see the player starts facing up. Um, but in the room itself, in throne room, he's facing down. And in the sequence as well, he's also facing down. So when he enters that room, he's only facing up because of that broadcast message, basically. Uh, what to do next is kind of a toss up between uh, the text or um, having multiple sequences you know, and progressing through them like a story. Um, I think it's going to take less time to do that. So we, we're going to, I'm going to update this first sequence and then make a second one. So uh, I'm going to probably make this about 300 seconds long. And then they have they all stretched. Cool. Okay. So this keyframe is when he gets here. And then I'm going to have the NPC. I'm going to make him move around the player. So let's uh, give him a keyframe. And then like here, he's going to move from there to there. See if this works. Cool. And then give him another keyframe. And then I want him to move. I need grids on. There we go. Let's try this out. That didn't work very well. Let me just delete some of these. Click on these keyframes and delete to delete them. So we're up to here right now. Then when he gets here, I want him to have moved to there. Does he do that okay? He does. And when he gets here, I don't want that to be like that. Let's test it. No, when he gets here, I want him to have moved down here.
actually. Let's make him move further than that. Uh, oh no, that's wrong. So I'm, I'm going to say 25 frames for every tile. So uh, we'll move four. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Oops. So let's try this now. There we go. And we're going to have the player turn. Well, let's let's do the uh, NPC. So from here, he needs to face left, which is going to be another broadcast message. So broadcast message is going to be dollar one underscore one. And then here, we need to tell them to face right uh, down again, which is number two. So dollar one underscore right down. So if we run the game and play the sequence, we'll see that in action. There we go. Awesome. And I'm going to have the player character uh, turn. So when he gets here, around about here, I'm going to have the player turn to face him. So another broadcast message, dollar sign zero. Uh, and then it should be one, I believe, to face right. And then as he gets to like here, maybe have the player face down. So dollar zero underscore and then two. So let's run the game, see how this looks. And I think I'll have the player move towards the same location. Uh, and that, that will be the end of the sequence. So, uh, player. So, where are we to? It's here. If I add a, a key for the player, and then the one, two, three tiles we want him to move to here let's just play that see what it looks like oh it's too fast maybe i'm going to extend the track a bit more Okay, so here's the player. Okay, and then one, two, three. We want him to move from here to here in that time. There we go. Okay, right. And if we run the game, press F5, make sure they're all facing the right way. Awesome. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a second sequence, but uh, I'm going to do that off camera. Um, hopefully you've kind of seen how I have made the characters move around in this first one. The second one is not going to be uh, any different. Um, so we'll do the second sequence. I'll show you how to increase the story value and how to play different sequences based on that value. And then we'll do the text and we will be done. Okay, so I've just made the second sequence. I'm just gonna uh, make sure that it looks okay. Um, so I'm gonna go into cutscene, create event, and then change, uh, where are we? There it is, 
change the one to a two and then run the game again f5 so they meet in the middle play spins around and and that's it so we're, we're now going to uh we're now going to like i said increase our story val at the end of each of these sequences and um, all we need for this really is a script so let's make a new script if i can find what the hell oh that's why custom order helps me a lot better there we go it's the scripts i'm just going to call it uh increase story file All we're going to do is global dot story val plus plus so increase story val by one and now i've done this uh, i'm going to go into obj underscore cutscene in the create event I'm going to now enable this line. So now we have two sequences ready to play. And the only thing we need to do now is actually implement our script. And if I go into each of my sequences, the very end of each of them, I'm going to add a moment, which is this uh, lightning bar. And you can just put the name of a script inside here. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to type increase and then here it comes a script uh, you can't pass it arguments if you could uh, we'd probably use that for changing sprites but you can't so uh, we're just going to use it for this so all you have to do type that okay and then in the second one at the very end again click on the lightning type inc there we go okay and I think we can test this now, see if this works. So every time we go to the room, we should see a new sequence. And the third time there should be none and the player should be able to move left and right because they haven't given him back and forth movement yet. But anyway, so this is the first sequence. Now I'm gonna press F5. And again, this is the second sequence left and right and a third time no sequence and we can move around and let me show you something else say for example uh yeah so basically just by increasing the global dot story val that's how we get uh different sequences to play in different rooms at different times um we could do a test where uh we have a gap in between the sequences so when the global story value is zero we play a sequence and then when it's one, we don't. And then when it's two, we play another sequence and that would work. All we need is some kind of uh, key press. Let's do it actually, let's, let's, let's test this. So um, let's go into here. And then we're gonna comment this out and we'll say two equals sequence two. Uh, max story points, that should still be okay. Okay, and then we're going to need a key press to increase story val. So we're going to the player step event. We're going to copy this line, line 31, for pressing F5. And we'll say if we press F7, then global dot story file increases by one. There we go. So let's do the test, run the game. So we go to the first room, we see the first sequence. I can move, go back to the room and go back here again. There's no sequence. If I was to now press um, F7, we should play, we should be able to see the second sequence. Is that right? No, we have to change the rooms. Okay, so let's go back to the main room and then we'll press F7 now and then go back to the throne room and now we get the sequence. So uh, as long as we play within the rules of the code that I've done, 
you know. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to have the sequences play for each other. You can have gaps, you know, um, and this should scale well. Okay, so now we have to make a new object called obj underscore text engine. Uh, make sure you make it persistent because we're just going to place it in the main room, which we will do now. So in, in room start, I have these two objects. And then if we go into the create event, we have a state system. We're either going to hide the text or display it. And then we're going to have one variable for now uh, called total text to display, which is you know all the text we want to display. Uh, first of all, we're just going to display all the text at once. And then uh, the final part will be uh, having talking text. I, I figured that if I do that last, then um, you know hopefully that, that that will save some people time because they may not want talking text. Why wouldn't you? I don't know. Anyway, so uh, end step event. We have um, what what will happen is in our sequence we're going to use broadcast message to send a message to our uh, cutscene object. Um, that cutscene object is going to pause the sequence, and then uh, we will have some text to display, uh, which means this is going to be true. And if we press space while there's text to display, we're just going to play the sequence again and uh, reset our text to nothing. And then uh, we have one more event, which is the draw GUI. So if there is text to display, uh, we need a new font. I'm calling mine uh, FNT Manor. If you want to make that now, uh, get it out of the way. Uh, I have it as size 24. And I'm using uh, a mono space font, which means every character is the same width, which is useful for talking text. Not mandatory, but it's useful. Um, if you want to use the same font that I do, then just search for mana space, download mana space font, and, and you'll find it easily enough. Um, so back to the draw GUI. So we set the font, uh, H alignment, V alignment. We want to draw from the top left and the color of the text is going to be white. Uh, this stuff here uh, looks like a lot. It's literally just setting up the text box. So uh, font size is the size of our font. The margin, so the space that we want um, between the sides of the sprite and the text, that's what margin is going to be used for. Um, let me just show you one thing as well. So I know this was at the start of part one, or part two, but we're going to be using this text box now, which uses nine slice. So this is what sprite that I'm talking about right now. Okay, uh, box width and box height. Um, literally, how wide do we want the text box to be and how high? Uh, box X and box Y, uh, what position on the screen do we want to display the box? Um, the origin of my text box is the bottom center. So like right here. So if we look at the box Y display get GUI height, so uh, it's going to be displayed from the very bottom and very middle of the screen. And X scale and Y scale is based on the width of the box that we want to display divided by the actual width of the sprite. Same for the height. That's going to tell nine slice um, how big, oh, sorry, the scale to draw the box, basically. So that's all this stuff is, is to literally just to set up the, the text sprite. Then we're going to draw it. Let um, me zoom out a bit. So this line's going to draw the, the sprite, and then I'm going to break down this line into two. This is what draws the text. So I'm going to draw it. Uh, the X coordinate is the margin. The Y coordinate is box Y, which is the bottom of the screen, minus box height, which is how high the box is, plus margin. So it's basically the top of the box plus whatever margin equals. That's going to be the Y coordinate of the text. And then total text to display. 
that's our whole message. Um, separation, so uh, we're using draw text ext, which is going to draw line by line, just one whole string, and it's asking for uh, the width in pixels between the lines, which is this font size times 1.5, which gives us a nice space. And then finally, uh, the width of the line, so how much space across the screen should one line take, and that's going to be display get GUI width minus margin times two because you want the text to display the whole screen width but have margin on either side and that's it uh, so one last thing to do is actually put a message into one of our sequences so um when the player gets to here it's going to be I'm going to I'm going to put the message here for now but it's going to look a bit weird because the NPC is going to move first but I can you know I'll fix it afterwards anyway so um and we are going to and we are going to use the at symbol so click to make a broadcast and then we need to do at and then hero and then uh oops double click to open it and then there we go that'll do and the last thing to do is <laughs> i keep saying that uh the last thing to do is to update our cutscene object in the broadcast message event so uh, in our switch statement, we have a new case, which is the at symbol, which is what I just used in the sequence. Uh, it's not very big. Uh, let me zoom out. There we go. So if you, if you remember, the first character of the string is going to be the symbol, which will bring us to here. Um, we just want to tell the text engine to display the string. So uh, we want to miss out the, the symbol. So we're going to use string copy. We're going to copy the whole string but only from the second character, which will skip out the symbol. And, and total text to display is going to be the whole string minus the first character, basically. And then um, we also want to pause the sequence so we can allow the player time to read the message, however long they want to take, and then um, press space to recontinue. So that's what this is about. If we run the game, we can see this in, see this in action now. So press F5, and here we have a message. You can see the sequence is paused. It's gonna stay like this until I press space, which I'm gonna press now. And that's literally how to get interactive text into a sequence. Okay, so now we're gonna get on with talking text. Uh, there's quite a lot to it. Uh, I don't know if my code is efficient, but you know, uh, it does the job. Anyway, so uh, we're going to need to add a couple of things in the broadcast message event of OBJ cutscene. Uh, we're going to have two new variables for the text engine. We're going to have, uh, oh, sorry, one, one, one new variable at least. Uh, display text. So we're going to have uh, total text to display is going to be the whole string that we want to display. And then display text is going to have a character added to it every uh, draw event, so which is usually every step, but anyway, um, and that's how we are going to gradually show the text. Um, and we're also going to use the state system that we made that I haven't used yet. So we're going to set the states of the text engine to display. And then inside the create event of OBJ text engine. Uh, we're also initializing our new variable display text and in the end step uh, we're no longer setting total text display to nothing we're just gonna use our state system to hide uh, the actual well change the state which hides the you know uh, the text box and the text and then in, in the draw GUI Okay, so first of all, we're replacing uh, if total text display is empty with our state, checking we are displaying it. 
uh, these variables should all be the same as before. Uh, and then we have a region of new variables. So we want to know uh, how how wide do we want to allow our text lines to be. Then we're, we're going to calculate calculate the start position of text X and text Y, which is going to be based on the origin point of the sprite. Uh, but we want to start basically in the top left of the text box. And then these two lines here are what is adding uh, characters to display text. It's pretty simple for now. And then this region here is like 90 lines long. So <laughs> we're, get, we, we're gonna get on with that now. Okay, so draw character by character. So we have all these new variables. Um, basically, we're just setting, up, set, setting these up to tell our text engine uh, the rules. So, uh, car index is going to track the progress along the string in the same way we have index in the broadcast event for our cutscene object. Uh, we're going to use this, you know, uh, this variable in the same way. Uh, max cars per line. So, basically, how many characters do I want to have per line? Um, if you don't have a monospace font, this isn't going to work as well for you. But because I know every character I'm going to draw, is the same width, I can just say, okay, I want to have 30 characters per line. But um, I don't actually know how many characters are gonna fit per line. So I'm just gonna use this formula. So max text width, take away font size times two divided by font size will give me how many characters I can draw per line. And max lines, so um, how many lines of text can I fit in my text box? It's the formula for this. Uh, characters per line. So uh, I'm going to track how many characters are on the current line that I am drawing uh, because uh, the main thing about this kind of text engine is you want to keep track of words because um, you don't want to draw half a word and find out you're at the end of the line and then draw the next half of the word on the next line. So you want to check basically uh, to make sure each word is going to fit on the line um, and if it doesn't then you uh, Increase your line number and then draw the word basically. That's all we're trying to do uh, Line number which line are we drawing on? temp index uh, so We need a way to be able to track to see whether we've already checked um, to see if a word will fit on a line because the way that I'm doing it is I'm just checking to see if uh, car which is going to hold the each character from the string I'm going to check to see if this is not a space if it's not a space I'm going to assume it's part of a word um, but I don't want to check uh, to see if the word will fit on it for as many for as many letters that are I just want to do that check once so temp index is going to get set to car index whenever I have checked a word. So that should stop it from happening uh, too often. Line dialog is uh, just going to store um, the strings that are on each line. We're not actually going to use them to draw, although you could. It's simply because um, I wanted an easy way to just delete uh, the top line whenever we get to the max lines and there's more text to come. So that's the reason I have that. Uh, there's certainly other ways to do it. You just need to know basically how many uh, how many characters are on that line to delete, but I just decided to copy the whole string to it and then just, just delete that. You'll see what I mean as we go along. I know a lot of what I'm gonna say isn't making sense, but um, as we go along, hopefully it will do. So, um, here, while car index is less than or equal to the string le length of display text. So um, basically, um, if we haven't shown all of the characters inside the display text, and because it's a while loop, this happens every step. And then every step, a new character gets added to display text, and then all of this is gonna happen again. Um, text engines like this can be quite uh, a resource 
in, or draw intensive because you're doing so much every step. I haven't found a better way to do that though, really. Um, okay, so get the next character. By now, you should understand what this does. Um, here, as the comment says, if the character isn't a space and we haven't checked if the current word will fit, how do we know that we haven't checked? Well, if temp index is less than car index, we haven't checked. So if this is true and this is true, then we need to check if the word's going to fit in a line, which is this region. So word length is just going to track how many characters are in the current word. We're going to update temp, temp index. Um, we're going to use uh, a different variable to to get the different characters from total text. We don't want to use car. We want to save that, you know, for actual drawing and stuff like that. So as long as temp car is not a space, just increase the index, uh, increase the size of the word and get the new character. If at some point we've already reached the end of our total text string, then we're just going to break out of this loop. Otherwise we'll get a crash. So that's this region. So after this region happened, so um, after this region, if we have, we, we want to do a check basically to say, okay, so uh, if we add the size of the new words to how many characters we have on the line at the moment, and if it's greater than the maximum characters we want, then we have to make a new line. So we're going to increase line number. We're going to reset cars per line because we're starting from the left again. And then um, we also have to do another check because we might have had our maximum lines. And so we don't want to draw below, you know, that, uh, that last line. We want to delete the top line. So all the other lines move up by one. So that's what this region is going to do. Um, if line number is greater than max lines, we have to delete the top line. So uh, we update our total text to display and dis display text by deleting whatever string is stored inside the first entry of line dialog. Remember, we're only using line dialog, this array, to store uh, what characters are in which line. That's the only reason we use it, just to make this bit easy. And then uh, after we've updated our two variables that hold our strings, we're going to delete this first entry from line dialog. So basically, you know, we had we had four lines and the top line could say hi. Well, that's going to get deleted now. And whatever was on the line below moves up and, you know, it just all the uh, entries move up one basically. And uh, because we've deleted an entry from the array, we then want to reduce line number by one. And you might say, well, you've added it here and you've taken away, so why even increase it? Because uh, we have to add to it to be able to check to see if we've gone past the max lines. That's why. And then this line here is what actually draws each character in the loop to uh, the screen. And like I said, it happens. Uh, this happens once per character every step. So that's why it's pretty intensive. Um, it does allow you to, to, to do cool things though, like change the font or color uh, mid, uh, mid sentence, stuff like that. Um, and this line is adding whatever car equals to the current entry in our line dialog array, just so we can make deleting easier. Then we have this region here. So did we get to the end of the line? It's just like another check. Um, we're increasing car index and cars per line. Um, if we have then found out, okay, well, we have literally just got to the end of a line, then we're going to increase line number again, reset cars per line. Uh, this code is just exactly the same as we had before. Um, maybe we should make, a, make that into a script. Uh, I just thought it would be easier for you to see it like this. That's the main reason. So that's that region. And that's it. So um it seems like a lot of work but uh you have to do that really if you want something like this so press f5 and then we can now see 
our talking text like that and then uh, it's waiting for us to press space but what I'm gonna have as well uh, the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have like a nice uh, like arrow pointing down um, to kind of uh, give the player the idea okay you know we're waiting for your input so that's what we'll do next okay so here we go with the final bit we're gonna do today uh, in well we're gonna add a new sprite first and uh, I stole this from Final Fantasy um, I've just called it SBR underscore text underscore arrow this is the sprite and then in the create event of our text engine we're gonna have two new variables we're gonna have pause which is a boolean it's gonna be set to false when it's true we're gonna see the arrow move up and down we're also going to have pause timer. Uh, this is how we are going to animate our sprites. Uh, some people like to use objects, which makes animation easier. <clears throat> I like to use less objects and just use stuff like this to animate things like that. Um, the way that I have this pause thing set up as well means that you can actually pause text uh, halfway through. Uh, we're, not, we're not going to be doing that in this session because it's already kind of gotten pretty... Uh, you know, twice, three times as big as, as I thought it would be. So anyway, two new variables. In the end step, uh, we've replaced this line with this line. So if we're paused, we're going to uh, increase pause timer by this value. And that's, uh, we're going to use this value to animate the sprite. Like I said, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, we just, yeah, let me explain it in the draw agree. And then uh, if we press space, while we're paused, then set pause to false, and then this is the same as before. And then the last update is going to be in the draw GUI. Uh, let's go up here, there isn't too much. So uh, we had these two lines to say, you know, to uh, if display text wasn't as big as total text to display, they just add a character. Um, but we're going to wrap that uh, to say um, if pause is false. If uh, display text is equal to total text display, uh, then we're just going to automatically pause the text. And that's what's going to start the arrow moving up and down. Uh, because at the very bottom, this is not new. Oh, uh, I don't think I mentioned this last time, but this, uh, these two lines were how we were drawing text before. We can just delete them now. We don't need them. And at the very bottom, yeah, at the very bottom, okay. So here, uh, here's our very last curly bracket. This curly bracket is the end of the while loop and it matches up with line 48, this one here. Uh, can we minimize that? Okay, and then um, this region is here. The, this region is new. We're just gonna draw the moving arrow there. So if we're paused, scale is six because it's a tiny sprite. Um, pause X is gonna be to the right of the text box. Pause Y is gonna be near the bottom, but we're also adding the mod of pause timer divided by 10. The bigger the number, uh, the slower it goes, um, but also in the end step, uh, the bigger the number, uh, the faster it goes as well. So uh, I like these values, but you know, if you play around with them, you'll get different results. Um, and then we're just going to draw our text arrow. So let me show you what it, what it looks like in, in the uh, actual game. F5. Like that. So now it's clear to the player, you know, they have to press space. Like I said, if you uh, want to have pauses in the middle of your dialogue, then you can just use a symbol for that. Um, I don't know if it's worth me doing like another tutorial. I don't think I should do it, off, you know, in this tutorial because it's already like 50 minutes, I think. So it's, it's quite a long time. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you to my patrons for voting for this video. Uh, it was uh, something new for me to learn. And uh, there's a special competition for this. Uh, for this episode, whoever can tell me how many times I changed my t-shirt uh, in this video 
uh, they will get a special prize. Uh, but that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.